Calaroga Shark Media. Hey there, I'm Johnny Mac with your daily comedy news. I'll do the Hinchcliffe stuff in the second half of the podcast to give us all a break. Let me just take a minute here. Let's just catch our breath. I had to work a little bit hard to put a show together today because if you Google comedy comedian, it's all the same topic. And I really covered that on Wednesday's show if you want to go there. Uh, tomorrow on the podcast, no politics, no Tony Hinchcliffe. I can guarantee that because I've already recorded Friday. So behind the scenes, I have learned over the years of doing this that sometimes it's good to record one in advance because life gets in the way. Fridays tend to be a day where I can do that sort of thing because it's album release day and they're just predictable events on Fridays. I did find some time to watch some comedy specials. I watched both Tom Papa's Home Free and Seth Meyers' Dad Man Walking, both of which I have trouble remembering the titles of. For Papa, I love the beginning about parenting. Tom and I are both 55 years old. His youngest daughter recently went off to college, mine too. So I was in the zone there and everything he was saying was clicking with me. Then there were diminishing returns as the hour went on. It's a nice, solid special. Um, you know, nothing amazing about it. A lot of Jim Gaffigan vibes, like a lot. Like if, uh, I don't know, if you read me the transcript and told me it was Jim Gaffigan's new special, I would be like, yeah, obviously it is. Uh, a lot. I can't understate this. A lot of Gaffigan vibes. I thought Seth's special is actually a better version of Papa's special, both talking about being dads. But I did like Seth's special a little bit more. Both have made my end of the year list, but those two will be the top two in tier two. So I've kind of got 15 that are really good. And then there's a gap to the things that deserve to make the list, but aren't as strong as those first 15 so far. And we have a lot of specials coming for the rest of the year. Seth told the Last Laugh podcast he was very on the fence about making the title of his new special a corny pun. Seth said, I was very hesitant to put dad or father in the title, but director Neil Brennan made the point that it would amount to false advertising without it. Seth said, it was nice to depart from what we do every night at the TV show and talking about my family puts me in a better mood than talking about politics. Tom Papa spoke to the L.A. Times. They were curious about how he works relatively clean. There are two S-bombs in the new special, and Papa said it was never a conscious thing that I had to think about at all. The best comedy has to be true to who you are, and no matter what, and honestly, I don't really speak that way in my real life, so to throw it into my act would seem forced and weird. Now, in the early 90s, when I was a younger up-and-coming comedian in New York City, I did think I had to be dirty and edgy to keep up with those other guys during that time, but even the audience could tell that it just didn't fit my personality. It wasn't who I was, and they got that vibe. They were looking at me with weird looks. I just figured, hey, there's so much vulgarity in society. My act should be something of a higher quality than some kids I heard cursing up a storm in the playground in New York City. People laugh. I think I do well with it. It's me just being who I am. I've always been attracted to talking about personal things, family life, and the bigger questions of just being a human being. I do discuss politics a little bit in my life, but I feel like in comedy there are lots of other comics out there who are more skilled at that approach, and I'd rather watch those guys who are great do that and be great at my own style. John Mulaney hosts Saturday Night Live this week. That should be good. Mulaney's usually really good episodes. And, uh, the, you know, the thing is happening on Tuesday, so there's plenty to talk about. Stavros Halki has put out that movie last Friday. I thought there'd be a lot more buzz and press from Stavros, but not so much. He did speak to Icon vs. Icon and shared that we got cable kind of late, like in my teen years. We got Dish Network because they had Greek channels. Initially, we weren't allowed cable, but as soon as my dad found out you could get Greek TV on it, that's when we got it. That's when we got Comedy Central. And at the time, Comedy Central pretty much replayed Comedy Central half-hour specials and SNL. He says, even as a baby, I would sing songs, put on my little plays, and make my family watch. My parents bought me a little tape recorder. It was a little speak and spell type thing. Bizarrely, I would spend hours talking into it. I, it's funny to think back on now, but I was essentially recording a podcast, which is insane. So I guess even as little kids, we know what we're destined for, but that's really what it was. I've been doing stand-up since freshman year in college. I did an open mic in the basement of my dorms. So I've been pretty much doing stand-up since I was 19. It wasn't thought out. Then you wake up one day to realize you're a 35-year-old man with no other abilities, so you have to try and pivot to movies and turn to acting to flush out your career. But yeah, it's as simple as I loved it growing up, and I had the chance to do it, and I did it. That's the origin story. It's not anything crazy. I didn't want a job when I was 19, and I just did stand-up instead. Hey, the Jets are on Thursday Night Football tonight. Isn't that exciting? Last week, after the Rams played the Vikings, Amazon brought Nikki Glaser back. Remember her first appearance was terrible? Now, I didn't see her last week, but Awful Announcing said it was better. She had a few jokes about Rams backup quarterback, the very handsome Jimmy Garoppolo. 
Glazer said, Jimmy didn't throw a single pass, but he's definitely brought me to completion. And yeah, maybe Jimmy's going to ride that bench for the rest of his career, but I want to be that bench. Dignitaro is working out material. She's doing a residency at the Comedy Bar in Toronto. She says she's grateful for the welcoming crowds, which she refers to as the Canadian way. It's good to see everybody understands what a comedian working out material is. Jimmy Fallon told Howard Stern a story about visiting Belushi's grave. Howard was curious what he said to Belushi. Fallon said, I mean, that's between me and John. As Fallon tells the story, he cracked a beer and sat beside Belushi's headstone and struck up a conversation with him in the dead of night and says, I might go back and have another one. It was great. One-sided, but you know. Andy Richter told Cinnamon Blend he was at a diner a couple years ago. It was a Sunday morning at a very popular restaurant in Burbank. There was one seat left at the counter and I sat down. I turned to my right and there was Jay Leno eating breakfast. You may recall the whole Leno-Conan rivalry. And he said it was like, uh, I guess we're going to chat now. And it was fine, you know. All that showbiz rivalry is like high school rivalry. Once you're past it, it's not that important. Jim Brewer spoke to the Jackson County Sentinel. Can you tell I deep dive to not talk about Hinchcliffe in the first half? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there wasn't much out there today. Jim said, there are always things that can become an obstacle to our happiness, and the big three for me that I smack into most are divisions in the family, financial struggles, and health issues. For me, there's no better feeling in the world than making someone laugh and knowing that I've inspired or healed someone. It's nice when people tell me I'm funny, but the ones that keep me going are the ones that come up to me and say, can I just tell you, I just lost my mom and you healed me. It's the first time I've laughed in ages. We're not here for very long. We're all stuck here together. Everybody needs to be laughing, be uplifted. We're here to take care of each other. I'm on a mission to lift you in the only way I know how. Late Nighter asked Jordan Klepper about Jon Stewart's involvement on the non-Monday Daily shows. Klepper said, John is hands off. He's here on Monday and we're in the morning meeting, but John has a vision for his show and then he's hands off. We're all hands off for the other people's weeks. So when you come in for your week, it's your week and you're using the other correspondents and the rest of the news team to be part of that week. And that's sort of how we see it as well. We try to be part of the other host weeks so that we're part of the show as well. Sometimes we're in joke meetings in the morning to give our two cents to find something fun. I'll send Desi articles. She'll send me articles or people or stories. So we're making the show collectively in that sense, but it's hands off when it's not your week. The show's complicated enough. It's a lot of work when you're hosting that you kind of don't have time to be overly democratic with a bunch of outside ideas. You're like, all right, it's my show. We're going to all work together on this. Let's go. Terry Garr passed away Tuesday at age 79. Terry known for many fantastic things in her career, including appearances on David Letterman's programs. Letterman's YouTube channel posted a clip from April 1st, 1983, and a short but sweet message saying, remembering one of our all-time favorite guests, Terry Garr. The rest of the show is Hinchcliffe and politics. Mark Norman tweeted, Ironically, Tony Hinchcliffe could use a good PR person. Very well crafted. Luis J. Gomez said, Comedians piling on a Tony should be ashamed. We make jokes. That's what we do. And also, most of the comics talking crap are terrible comedians who don't actually work. If you do take a look, with the exception of Michael Ian Black and Mark Marin, most of the comedians commenting are less famous. Joe Biden said, I'd like to take that guy out for a swim there anyway. Robert Smigel tweeted from the Triumph account. He signed it off RS, so I won't do the half ass Triumph impression. Smigel wrote the sick thing about the crude comments by the Trump rally speakers is the clear contempt they have for his supporters. Every one of those comments bombed with the audience, but Team Trump thinks they're all dumb racists and women haters. The deplorables were the ones on stage. The character Triumph hit the Trump rally the other day. He was chanting with some uh, supporters. Triumph said, this is nothing like a Nazi rally. The Nazis were in shape, first of all. They took care of themselves, unlike this guy over here. Seriously, when I look at you, it makes me think that groceries aren't expensive enough. I need some water. I can't get down to the gravelly part to, uh, to do a half-ass triumph. It's quarter-ass triumph today. On the topic of abortion, quarter-ass triumph said, what would you say about people worried about losing that right, aside from what is it like to have sex? Stephen Colbert said the Hinchcliffe joke somehow broke through the noise, and as a master political satirist myself, I'm completely jealous because what we do here is jokes all the time, and it changes nothing. What was the difference in making here? The target? Okay, then tell me which countries to crap on. I'll do it. Okay, Australia, you're the garbage island. Anything? Anyone? Colbert continued, here's a little pro tip. When you're running for president, try not to October surprise yourself. Ronnie Chang said it's still crazy to me that a joke from Trump's warm-up guy seems to be having more of an impact than Trump's actual terrible record on Puerto Rico. I mean, his administration blocked Puerto Rico from receiving hurricane relief. Then Trump went down there and tossed paper towels into the crowd. 
I guess to help them soak up the hurricane? And to top it off, Trump tried to trade Puerto Rico for Greenland. I mean, he'd rather have a frozen wasteland than a tropical paradise full of brown people with good music? What a stupid idea. No one in Greenland can play shortstop. Fantastic joke there, Ronnie. Fantastic. Jane continued, of course Trump's not a Nazi, okay? They all famously served in the military. Also a great joke. And one more from Ronnie, who was crushing it. You may have seen Trump claim to be the opposite of a Nazi, and Ronnie said, What exactly is the opposite of a Nazi? Is it the guy who started J-Date because they're trying to make more Jews? Or is it the guy who has, like, the reverse mustache, like everything else, but not that part? <laughs> Good stuff there. No politics, no Hinchcliffe tomorrow. That's your comedy news for today. See you here.